Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank Hello. Thank you so much. Okay, so please, everybody, mute yourself. And uh, dear Jetsuna has joined us for this session of question and answer. I've made an opening speech. Um, but deepest gratitude for you with being with us for being with us today. And um, please, if you want to say a few words, or shall we start? Just start because we have twenty-two yeah. questions, not that long. <laughs> That's true. Okay, so we're going to start with the first question, and it's from Hannah, and she's asking, saying. Being a mother requires loving, nurturing, and preferring the well-being of your children above all other sentient beings, including yourself. This, by definition, creates attachment. How can one be a mother without creating attachment? Huh. Well, you know, I mean, of course, the Buddha himself used the mother as the uh, example of perfect loving kindness. He says in his Sutra on loving kindness, just as a mother loves her child, her only child. But attachment is regarded as the near enemy of loving kindness. The direct enemy, of course, is, is hatred. But nonetheless, that's the subtle near enemy. It, it, and so what it means is attachment means clinging, like grasping which in uh, Buddhist psychology is regarded as uh, the cause of our suffering and insecurity. So therefore, the, the, what we need to do is to learn how to love without clinging. So the example one could give is like a beautiful butterfly in your hand, right? And you look at the butterfly, beautiful butterfly, you love the butterfly, how beautiful it is. But if one says, oh, butterfly, you're so beautiful. Don't worry, I'll always look after and protect you. Look, I'm looking after you. No butterfly. Yeah. Right? So, so that's the point, is to, to hold gently, lightly, caringly. There's lots of love, but without this, you know, attachment, this grasping. The grasping is the problem. That's what we have to look at and what we have to learn how to release, hold gently. That's beautiful, Jetsuna. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to say, not so easy to do. <laughs> it's hard to do. Yeah, but you can do it. My mother was always a great example of that. I mean, she loved me enormously, but she, because she loved me, she was able to let me go and to come to India and to lead the kind of life I needed to lead. And she never ever said, what about me, your poor old mother, you know? And that was a, the mark of her great love for me, yeah. that she was able to help me yeah. to, to go. To set you free. Mm, yes. Thank you. Okay. So can we move to the next question? Go on. All right. So the next question is from Yael. Uh, and she's asking, can you please speak about the Buddhist approach of dealing with anxiety and fear? Well, because this is a huge one. I mean, um, one could spend the, you know, the whole hour just talking about that. And, um, but I think in, in brief, first, we, we do need to become aware of these emotions, right? And not push them down and, and keep them, you know, usually we try to put them up and not let them up, you know, because we're, we're afraid of fear. Yeah. So, you know, of course, fear might be the resort to a danger, right? I mean, um, I mean, it might be a warning signal that there, there, there is something and we need to take care, you know, I mean, we're not stupid, right? So nature, I mean, if you look at it, all animals, including insects, they have that, that panic factor, right? So off danger is here, rear up, run away, right? So yeah. if it's a real danger, then we should, of course, act appropriately. I mean, that's the question. 
However, many people nowadays, especially, live in anxiety continuously without any real cause, right? And some people, when they meditate, fear arises. I mean, people imagine when you meditate, you're going to get great bliss. Yeah. But for many people, um, not great bliss, but fear or anger or strong negative emotion come up, right? Which is not what they're hoping for. So in this case, it's, it's actually important to allow the fear to come up and say, hello, fear, what's your problem? Tell me all about it. Right? And in other words, befriend the fear instead of being afraid and rejecting the fear. Because these negative emotions which we have pushed down in our psyche, they are in the darkness, and in the darkness they grow. So what we need is to bring them into the light of our awareness. You know, sit there, become calm and quiet, watching the breath or whatever. Then when these feelings come up, where in the body is this feeling? You know, sometimes in the stomach, sometimes in the chest. And, and just accept them with loving kindness. It's very important to, to really befriend these feelings and allow them to speak. Because a lot of these fear and anger and so forth is often from a pre-conscious time or maybe even from a previous life. You know, we don't know, we can't remember why we feel this fear or where it comes from. But, you know, you have to listen to the fear and feel compassion, like listen to a small child, right? Just gradually, if we accept these feelings and we allow them to come up and we, we kind of give them a hug, right? And we allow them into the light of our awareness, then gradually they, they really will begin to dissolve. Um, there, there was this very fascinating video clip about this woman who uh, goes uh, into the ocean and she meets with sharks and she puts her hand, well, her arm right into the shark's mouth and she pulls out hooks which have got caught in their throat because of fishermen. Whoa. And she's apparently um, liberating more than 300 hooks from these poor animals. And all around her are sharks. They're, they're all waiting for her to take care of them too. And this, I mean, apart from being incredible bodhisattva activity on her part, is how we should deal with something which we are most fearful of. In the ocean, the thing you fear most is sharks. And turning that round by befriending the sharks, giving them love and compassion, the sharks become your friends. So this is how we should deal with these, these dark emotions which come up. Make them our friend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jetsuma. Our next question is from Khalid. How can one help others who are in distress, experiencing great suffering and expect one to help them while at the same time keep one's well-being and be not negatively affected by their suffering? Well, again, you know, we have to balance our compassion with wisdom and insight. Otherwise, we, we, we just get swallowed up. I mean, uh, traditionally, it's said to be like the two wings of a bird, right? If you just have one wing flapping, like, you know, very compassionate, all feeling, but no ability to set boundaries or understand the situation from a wider perspective, or we have a lot of insight and wisdom, but no real heart, then it's like one wing in a bird. It can't get off the ground. It needs two wings to soar up towards enlightenment. So this is very important, you know, really. If we only cultivate empathy and compassion, right? And we have no deeper insight, then we will really soon burn out. And this is what happens with a lot of social workers and others who, who care about animal rights and, and human rights and so forth. You know, they're, 
you know, you need to meditate and you need to give back love and compassion to yourself too. We, I say, you know, you have to breathe in as well as breathing out. Because uh, either way, if you only breathe in or you're only breathing out, then you're going to end up being as asphyxiated. You need to get that balance between the two, right? So we need to understand the whole situation at a much deeper level. I mean, this is the thing. This is why we meditate and we study and, and we begin to get a, a wider perspective. You know, also, I mean, uh, to be honest, in Buddhism, we could also consider that what happens to us is the result of our karma, is the result of uh, things which we ourselves have done. And now how we are going to deal with that situation is will be creating the, the future for ourselves. So the, the present is very important also to be to have not just the compassion, but also the wisdom to deal with the situation intelligently. Right. So the point is that events, nothing happens just by accident. Everything is the result of causes and conditions. And we, we should have, therefore, this, this wider perception. If, we have, if we're sowing poisonous seeds, we're going to get a poisonous plant. And we have to appreciate that. I mean, I, to my mind, one of the great examples that we can look at in the world is like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I mean, people are always coming from all over the world and telling him their sad stories, their tragedy in their lives. And when he hears it, he weeps because, you know, he really feels it and he knows himself, you know, what this tragedy is that they're talking about. But then five minutes later, he's roaring with laughter. And they are too. They all come out smiling and feeling like they took a heavy burden and they put it in his lap and he accepted it and was able to allow it to dissolve. He's not holding it like a rock inside his heart. I mean, when one sees the, the images of him with uh, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, for example, both of them have had so much tragedy in their life and they're just roaring with love, there's so much joy, right? And, and, and that shows the wisdom in, in their lives and they appreciated that in each other so much that they both of them took in so much suffering, but gave out joy in, in its place. So that's what we have to do, right? So I would say it's very important to take care of ourselves as well as taking care of others, give ourselves loving kindness and compassion as the Buddha recommended, right? You start with yourself, then give out to others. Um, to meditate on shamatha, um, calm abiding meditation, to make the mind quieter and more calm and, and clear. You know, that's very healing for the mind. You know, we have to have a healthy mind in order to really benefit others, right? And then also contemplate the goodness in the world. Contemplate all the light. Don't just always focus on the dark. You know, there is so much goodness in the world, everywhere. And everyone, their nature is basic goodness, right? And we should recognize that in each other. We all have good in nature, whoever, right? So, you know, I mean, but we have to understand this is samsara. That's the thing. You can't expect that it's not going, you know, that it's all going to be, you know, joy and bliss. As one of our nuns one time remarked, Sangsava is not a good plan. And that's true, it's not, but this is our learning ground, right? This is where we're going to develop our compassion and our understanding. So when you're with others in pain, you should maintain your own inner balance, right? And awareness, you know, it, maybe imagine them surrounded by light and love, right? So don't get sucked into another's suffering because that doesn't help them, right? And it only depletes our own positive energy. So if you're in the, in the presence of someone who is really, really suffering, send out light, send out love, and, and don't um, plug in to the darkness. Great. This is very helpful, Jitsuma. Thank you. Mm.
it's a difficult one because you know uh, samsara is difficult right people keep trying to make samsara comfortable but it isn't you know yeah i okay. mean it might be for short periods but it's not secure you know it, and these underlying problems are there you know and so the best we can do is to use it to cultivate our, our own love and compassion and help others as much as we can thank you so much uh, our next question is for me and it's a bit connected to the last one uh, and it goes how to bring into your daily life in spite of our strong feeling of an objective self a stronger notion of our continuum of consciousness and future lives in order to do more for all sentient beings and in order to practice more diligently. Mm. Well, I would say that we should lead our lives as though there was a future life, right? Then, if there is, we will be very grateful that we led a previously good life, right? Oh, thank goodness for that. Um, and if death is actually the end, then at least we use this present life meaningfully, right? And so we can die without regrets. So either way, that's a win-win situation, right? But right now, at least we use this, this life, you know, to the best uh, of our abilities to benefit ourselves and to benefit others. And, but, you know, and honestly and truthfully, so many people actually do remember previous lives. I mean, I was just talking to somebody right now who uh, had all these recollections of previous life. And she, she's an Indian from South India. She has no connection with Buddhism at all. But as soon as she saw an image of Guru Rinpoche, she felt this tremendous devotion and tremendous um, recognition that this was a being that she felt great devotion towards, you know? So, I mean, and she had no reason for that because she, you know, in her life until that moment, she'd never even seen Guru Rinpoche, right? So, um, you know, actually, I, I think also many near-death experiences, you know, what they, they find is inexplicable uh, unless there was a continuation of consciousness into next life. I mean, I think there probably is. I mean, I, I mean, I really do think there is. But anyway, even if there wasn't, it encourages us to be careful and, and to make the most of what we've got now while we're here. And then we can relax and uh, look forward to what happens next. The big adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, Jetsunma. Uh, our next question comes from an anonymous person and it goes like this. What measures would you take to dismantle or and decipher perfectionism? Some of it is due to a very strong habit of picking up irregularities in an instance for better and for worse. Would equanimity be one of these measures? I would say just relax, right? Nothing is perfect in samsara. So why bother, right? Yes, we can keep the mind relaxed, well balanced, and remember impermanence that everything is changing moment to moment anyway. So have a, a sense of humor. I mean, I really think relaxing and having a sense of humor about one's own need to make everything right, right? Just look at yourself smiling, nice sense of humor, not a mean sense of humor, right? And just be aware of that habit when it comes up, you know, how, how you want everything to be exactly how it should be. And then just let it go, right? Just relax. I mean, because otherwise, you know, you make your life and everybody else's life miserable. Just see things as they come and let them go. So, again, these open hands, right? 
Yeah. Because wanting everything perfect is also a form of grasping. It's a form of clinging. And that creates our suffering. Yeah. But in a nice way. I mean, I, I think it's very important that we shouldn't be beating ourselves up over our, our, our problems and our, our hang-ups, right? We, we should smile at them nicely, but at the same time, you know, begin to relax their hold. Yeah, smile is so important. Thank you. I think so. We smile at ourselves as well as others, you know, because people can be very harsh towards themselves, much more than they are even towards others. And that doesn't help us. It doesn't help us to improve. It just makes us uptight yeah. or depressed. Certainly. Thank you, Jetsana. Okay. Um, question number six is uh, from Tammy, different Tammy. Uh, she says, I discovered the Dharma 22 years ago when I was 50. I knew right away that I found that what I was looking for all my life. I was very happy and enthusiastic, and for years I studied and practiced. I could see the change that the Dharma has brought in me. However, in the last years, I feel that I'm stuck. I'm not able to advance, and that I'm losing my inspiration and joy. I don't know the reason for it. Please advise me how to continue. Well, you know, honestly and truthfully, this is a very common problem. Um, and even though it's a very common problem, there's no really straightforward answer. Um, my advice would be to accept the fact that sometimes we are more enthusiastic and sometimes less enthusiastic. This happens to everyone, even, you know, the great saints go through ups and downs. I mean, but the important thing is to keep at least a minimal practice going, right? It's like holding on to a rope, you know, until you can pull the whole thing back again. At least you're holding on there. You haven't dropped everything. So then, you know, maybe in time, the enthusiasm will come back. I mean, there's no reason why not. Everything is impermanent, including lack of enthusiasm. So at least to have faith in the Dharma, that it is true. Whether at this moment I am interested or not, the Dharma is true, even though we're not very connected at the present time, right? But in the meantime, you know, maybe try reading an inspiring book or watching a good teaching on YouTube, doing a short guided retreat. You know, we can try to kickstart our, our practice, but sometimes it's best just to let things slide and in the meantime, just keep a basic shamatha practice, you know, maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, bodhicitta, remembering all, all beings, trying during the day to be as aware as possible, as present, mindful, to keep a good, kind, open heart, to be generous when the opportunity comes. This is all dharma. You know, I mean, Dharma isn't just marathon retreats and, you know, hundreds of thousands of mantras and, and prostrations. Dharma is having a good heart, as His Holiness says. What are we doing here for? We are here to develop a good heart. And I don't think you ever can lose enthusiasm for that, right? So just try to be kind and try to be as present and conscious as possible. And, and genuinely go for refuge to the three jewels. And you know, think that all beings that you meet want happiness. May all beings be well and happy. Thank you, Jetsuna. Uh, next question is from Roni. My, my question is on trusting the path. And what to, this is question number seven. And what to do when you feel you lose trust? I've been a practitioner of Dharma for the last 10 years. The Dharma changed my views. It is an essential part of my life and it benefited me a lot. However, as much as the idea of karma means to me, 
Sometimes I feel very strongly that it is unjust. I still find myself at times losing trust in a deep way, becoming hopeless and suffering a lot of emotional pain. In these times, what could be best to focus on practice on what to focus on practice do? That's the question. No. Okay. Well, the point of the belief in, in karma and its results is that it does explain why some people naturally lead a happy, fulfilled life with no apparent effort and others struggle and still encounter difficulties and obstacles. So from a Dharma point of view, from a Dharma standpoint, this is because of their actions in previous lives, which are now ripening, right? We have all of us planted good seeds and bad seeds throughout our countless lives from a Buddhist perspective. And we don't know when those seeds will sprout, right? When the necessary causes and conditions arise, they will come to fruition. This may be lifetimes ahead, right? It doesn't mean that just because you plant seed immediately it comes up. It might be centuries before it comes up. But this is why good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people, right? Even if in this lifetime right now, they're very nice, they still have all the crop from, from past lives to deal with, right? So therefore the only thing that we can do really is to take everything onto the path and learn from our experiences, right? To use this life to cultivate the causes and conditions for a better life next time. I mean, this is the whole point of Lojong, the mind training, is that even when things come up which are very difficult and which we normally would think of as being an obstacle, if we change our attitude towards those things, then they become our opportunity for growth and uh, they become the next step on the path. Right? I mean, it's never considered that everything's always going to go the way I want it to go, right? Because that's just the ego wanting, as I say, to make samsara comfortable. The samsara isn't comfortable. And, you know, the point, the, the skill is to take everything and use it as an aid on the path. Then that's the way things are. Right? And we can accept it and learn. Otherwise, you know, we just, something bad happens and we just sit and feel sorry for ourselves. And then what's the use? We just make further bad karma for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank mm. you. Okay. Uh, next question is from Shakir. He says, I have difficulties in deciding what will be, this is question number eight. I have difficulties in deciding what will be my next job. It is also hard for me to know what I want to do in the future. What possibilities do I have to learn how to make the right decision? Well, I mean, you can, for a start, one can sit, quiet in the mind, and then ask the question, in the best circumstances, what would I really want to do, right? And then listen for the answer, which may come from within, from a deeper level of our, you know, I mean, normally we're, we're in contact with our very discursive, conventional, conceptual thinking mind, which is very busy and, and totally deluded. But if we calm down, we might be able to access a much deeper level of our consciousness, which actually does know. And so ask the question and then wait and listen, you know? But anyway, really, whatever we do, we can also develop the ability to accept what is. 
right? I mean, this is again the, the point. Sometimes there is no perfect solution. There is no perfect job, right? But we can change our attitude to the situation and the work and deal skillfully with whatever uh, happens, you know? So that, that is also in that way, we are still traveling on the path. That's the thing. I mean, people are always trying to make the, everything exactly perfect the way I want it to be, but mostly it's the ego that's having its own ideas. And the ego by its very nature is deluded. So, you know, but you can start by, by quietening the mind and then ask you, okay, if I, you know, if I had the perfect situation, what do I actually want to do? Right? And see what the answer is. Maybe you can do it, maybe you can't, but you know, well, all right, what, what do you want? Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. I don't know if it's helpful, but you know, the thing is that we are always trying to maneuver situations to suit ourselves instead of trying to create a self which will deal with all the, with all the situations. Do you understand? You know, we, we always think that if we maneuver out of circumstances, then we'll be happy. And we don't recognize that the real genuine happiness comes from our inner acceptance of how things are. Yeah. Like you've said, samsara is a difficult plan. It's not a good plan. And, but it's what we've got. And this is where we learn. It's our schoolroom. Great. Thank you. So we'll move on to the next question, which is from Liora. Reading the biography of Marpa, I learned that he kept on receiving more and more initiations and teachings, even after he has attained the deepest realizations. On the other hand, when Gampopa asked Milarepa for the last teaching before he left, Milarepa turned his back on him and showed him his bottoms, hard as stone, and told him just to sit and practice. Liora's asking, what can I learn from these two stories? How to find the balance between more and more teachings and the feeling that actually I have just to practice what I had already heard from the Lamas? Well, you know, honestly and truthfully, uh, especially in, in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, the different practices are endless. There are so many lineages, so many deities. Marpa was a translator and he was a major transmitter of the tantras from India to Tibet. So he wanted to get as much as possible and translate for the future of the lineage. But, you know, Milarepa just got what Marpa told him and just sat down and did it, right? He didn't get, you know, hundreds of different uh, practices. He only got, in fact, um, the uh, seven, uh, the six uh, doctrines of uh, Naropa and Mahamudra. That's all he ever practiced. And that's what he passed on. Ordinary people are best finding a practice that suits them, you know, that they feel comfortable with and then sticking to it until the benefits are realized. Otherwise, we're just digging lots of shallow holes in the desert and, and we will never reach the water source. That's the point. Milarepa only knew what he needed to get from Marpa and then he just sat down and did it, right? So that's the point. So get the teaching that you need from your lama, your teacher, and then just go away and practice. That's enough. That's all we need to do. Okay, thank you, Jetsuma. Uh, next question is from Orit. In Buddhism, great importance is attributed to one's consciousness at the time of death. What happens in that respect if the dying person suffers of dementia? Can anything be done to help? Okay, so basically the underlying subtle consciousness, right, 
still continues, even if one has dementia or is unconscious, right? That's the point. The, the, this dementia and, and unconsciousness is only the gross consciousness. It's not the very subtle consciousness. That continues. It never can break. And so don't worry, right? The, the, the subtle consciousness is still going. But it's good to say prayers quietly at the time of passing, you know, it just to, because even they, they might even be able to pick up that, but very quietly, not disturbing the person in any way but quietly, maybe even under your breath, recite mantras or say prayers and, and wish them well on their journey. But really, don't worry, the, the consciousness uh, continues. Okay. Uh, next, que next question is from David. He's asking, what would be your advice for dying people at the very last days or even minutes of their life? For instance, in case of a sudden critical health condition or a fatal accident. And please relate Jetsuma both to Buddhist practitioners and to secular people as well. Uh, well, if we know that death is going to be very soon, it's important to uh, advise people uh, to let go of their attachments and their resentments. Right. I mean, obviously, if they've got a fatal accident, there's no time. But in general, if someone like has a terminal illness or something like this, then we should say, let go now. Let go of your grasping at loved ones. Let go of all your resentments and anger to those who have harmed you in the past. Just let go. Forgive everyone who's harmed us. Right. And forgive ourselves, too, for all our past mistakes. That is also very important that we have forgiveness for ourselves. Then let those that we care about, if possible, let them know you love them. You know, don't go without saying, uh, you know, thank you. I really appreciate what you've done and our time together. This is good. Then, you know, actually make a good and fair will, right? Write a will about leaving your property and, and whatever so that it won't cause any problems later. There are so many problems with siblings afterwards because a will has been made, which was really very unfair and discriminatory, and then, you know, or not very clear. And it causes so much problems after the person has gone. So don't do that, right? Be very fair and think that you're going to leave something which will leave everybody feeling okay about that. Let go of any clinging to possessions, position, who you think you were, and, and all the people around you as much as you possibly can. Let it go because the only thing we're taking with us is our consciousness and our karma. Everything else we have to leave behind, our body, our house, our family, our dog, everything, they're all going to go but we are carrying with us our karma. So be very careful to have a mind which is, is released, you know, has let go. So, you know, sometimes because people are attached, then when they die, they, they still hang around a bit, right? People are, are conscious that they're, there's maybe relations or somebody are still there. They're still around. They see them or they feel them around after they died. So then it's good to encourage them, say thank you, but encourage them to leave and go on and not get stuck in the spirit realm, right? That's very interesting, Jetsuna. Yeah. The next questions are connected, I think. Uh, next question is from Yael, and she's asking, how do you explain communication with dead relatives in light of reincarnation? Well, I mean, of course, um, personally, and this is just personally, um, I don't think that we immediately necessarily get reborn in a human form, right? 
uh, we may be reborn in a very in the various stratas of uh, spirit realm. You know, in Buddhism, there are 26 different kinds of uh, celestial realms, for example, from the very uh, gross to the very subtle. So, I mean, a lot of people, I think, go into various spirit realms for a while. Um, it's said that uh, in, in that case, it's said that sometimes the spirits themselves volunteer to go down to the lower realms to help beings in the lower realms to, to come up. You know, so this is very good. So then our relatives also might be, you know, hanging out in the spirit realm. So that's why it's good to encourage them to um, not, not hang out too long, to, to go and to, you know, to keep evolving, not to get stuck. It's very easy to get stuck, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, we shouldn't want to stay in contact with them. That's the point. We, we should uh, try to, to um, help them to, to go onwards, not, not to um, try, keep trying to, you know, when I was, um, I was brought up as a spiritualist. And so we used to have seances every week in our house. And there was this couple whose son, uh, this was just after the war in the 1950s. And so there was this couple whose only son had died in, in the war. He, his tank had blown up. And uh, so they wanted always to get in contact with him. And he, he would say to them, let me go. I need to go on. You also need to go on. You have to go on with your life. Yes, it was too bad. I died. You know, it's very sad. But now I have to go forward. You also must go forward. Let me go. And they couldn't. And in the end, that broke up the circle because the spirit guide said, no, this is no use. Just keep calling him back like this. It's not helping you. It's not helping him. And let them go. So it's not good to try to hold on to people. They have their own journey. So you can say, we loved you. Sorry you've gone, but never mind. It's okay, you can go now. So, bon voyage. Yeah, thank you, Jetsuna. Next mm. question is also about death and the dead. It's from Nitsan. He's asking, how can we keep contact with the dead in a beneficial manner without grasping at our ego, pain and sorrow? Sometimes it feels that without feeling the aching heart, it's difficult to be in touch with them. And when we imagine their new lives, which are hidden for us, don't we encourage more delusions? Well, again, it's not good to keep the dead all around us. It really isn't. We must encourage them to leave and go onwards. We shouldn't seek to always be in touch with them, but we have to let them go. We have to let them go on. It's not fair otherwise, right? So we don't know how they will be reborn. So it's no good fantasizing about that. But we can imagine they have a better rebirth, wherever it is. We wish them, you know, well, for instance, we like to imagine here in our nunnery, we had a very old and faithful dog who was always very, very uh, fond of the nuns and would always sit outside the temple when they did pujas and, and she loved the nuns very much. And anyway, when she died peacefully and happily with the nuns saying prayers, we like to imagine that she would come back again next time in a human form and join the nunnery as a real nun. But whether she will do so, who knows? But that's what we wish for her. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you. Uh, our next questions, I think there are four of them, no, three, uh, regarding the practice of meditation. Uh, they're from Liora. Uh, first one is, regarding the experience in the practice of the nature of the mind, what is the role of the eyes? I feel that the more the eyes relax, the wider and deeper the experience gets. Well, different traditions are different. 
Um, in the Vipassana, they usually tell people to keep their eyes lightly closed. In the Mahamudra tradition, they're usually looking slightly down half um, to a, a, an easy distance in front of oneself, but keeping the eyes um, unfocused but open. And in the Dzogchen tradition, of course, they stare wide-eyed into space, right? As a way to connect with the inner space. Um, so basically it is important just to keep the, the gaze uh, focused. Like when I first started, I was given by this old yogi uh, a pebble. This is a very Mahamudra thing, uh, a pebble and put in front on the ground, one sitting on the ground, sitting in, in front, and to keep the gaze on the pebble, partly as a, a focus for one's attention, but also as a focus for the eyes, right? That you, you're not blink. Well, I mean, you can blink, it doesn't matter, but the, 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 the eyes should be staying in, in one place and uh, relaxed and uh, focused. So, but it's, it's important not to um, strain the eyes by staring, you know, but, but keeping it as, as Leora says, you know, just uh, very relaxed, but at the same time, not, um, you know, uh, flashing around, keeping them one pointed, either staring into space or staring uh, in front of oneself. Great, thank you. Um, next question, I think it's about uh, the breath. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes during a deep meditation, the breath is getting more and more shallow and slow to the point that it is almost not being felt at all, almost stopped. It is not frightening at all. It is a pleasant experience. Does it have any significance? Um, yeah, actually, this is very uh, normal um, when concentration deepens, right? Some people can stay apparently not breathing for hours or even days, right? When the lungs require breath, then the process starts up again. But when everything is in complete equilibrium, then likewise, um, the breathing becomes so subtle, it's uh, basically one is not breathing. But that's perfectly normal and uh, nothing. I mean, I mean, it's nice, it's good, but it's, it's not in any way uh, harmful. It's, it's perfectly okay. It's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Leora is, why is it so difficult to experience the spontaneous compassion that is supposed to naturally arise while being in the, no in the nature of the mind? I can feel it only by deliberately bringing the thought of compassion. It doesn't arise naturally. Can I do something about it? I would say, again, just relax. Don't worry, right? Actually, the nature of the mind experience, meaning recognizing our, our non-dual pure awareness, does interconnect us with everything, both animate and inanimate, you know, because it's this non-dualistic, level of mind where we are we feel our interdependence and interconnection and this feeling of interconnection normally would naturally um, arouse our inherent empathy and hence our compassion right without trying naturally we feel this connection with all beings so it's not as though You know, the point is that that inherently, that level of consciousness, we're really all the same, right? We're, it's only our dualistic sense of me and others which makes us seem separate, right? And we're the same and all beings do want happiness. And because we don't realize our true nature, we suffer. Isn't that sad? So therefore, you know, when we are in this, the nature of the mind, when we have that sense of the nature of the, our pure consciousness, that naturally interconnects us with all beings. And therefore, in that level, we naturally feel 
uh, empathy and, and a feeling of oneness with all the beings. That's why you don't need to try to develop, develop co compassion. It's just there as, as part of the realization. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, next questions are regarding meaning of Buddhist terms. Um, next question comes from three different people, Sharon, Yonit, and Michal, number 17. And they're asking, what is freedom and what is enlightenment? And if it's possible, kindly explain that it's another meaning of emptiness <laughs> in a way <laughs> that may help understand it. <laughs> oh, just simple little. Well, okay, let's try some definitions here. So freedom or liberation is being free of our ego, right? Our egoistic identification, me, right? Which brings along with it, the sense of me also brings along with it our afflictive emotions like anger, greed, attachment, jealousy, pride, and all these other things, which are all based on our ignorant self-cherishing mind, right? So if we let that go, if that can dissolve through our wisdom, then it's like dropping a heavy backpack full of rocks that we've been carrying up the mountain. <sighs> what a relief. What a release, right? That's the feeling. The mind is clear and open instead of being boxed up with our conceptual thinking, right? Which is always revolving around me, right? When that goes, that's freedom, right? Enlightenment, on the other hand, <laughs> Uh, means different things to different people. I mean, it's a lot whether you mean enlightenment with a little e or enlightenment with capital letters radiating lights, right? So the big E is Buddhahood. And that means the complete eradication of all our ego-based ignorance and 100% in the state of non-dual awareness 24 seven, right? You are totally immersed in super mundane, pure consciousness at all times. So according to the, the sutras, this also means that we know the three times, we know the past, we know the future, and as well as knowing, seeing the present exactly how it is, not through the lens of our delusion and our uh, misapprehension, it means total omniscience, right? But small enlightenment, enlightenment with little e, usually just means some genuine realization on the nature of the mind, right? Some genuine realization of the next thing, which is emptiness, shunyata, right? So shunyata is another word which is, changes its meaning in, in uh, depending on the context, right? But emptiness, I'll call it emptiness, but that's shunyata. Emptiness is not a thing or a dharma in itself, right? It, but it points to the non-self-existent nature of all dharmas, of all things, right? So normally we think of things as being very solid and separate and the way they appear to our senses, right? Everything is just how it is. And th this is reality. But actually, actually nothing exists in isolation, but only in a state of interdependence and interconnection. We don't see that, that's our problem. Things look enduring and solid, but the thingness in itself can never be found. You can never really find the thing which can ne never ever be reduced into something else and is totally solitary and not interconnected with anything. You can't find that however much we look, either in the mind or in external um, objects. So 
everything can be reduced to ever more subtle levels without anything real or interdependent ever being found. And the empty spacious nature of reality therefore allows for everything to manifest because it's, it's this openness, this spaciousness that's with objects. And when it comes to the emptiness of the mind, then thoughts and feelings themselves are not solid and real. We believe in our thoughts and feelings, but actually they're, they're just momentary mental impulses, right? They're like bubbles. They look very bright and solid, but click, you know, where, where is it? It's all empty, right? They're empty and they disappear. So even the nature of our mind, our pure primordial awareness, even that is compared to an empty sky. It's compared to space because you can't grasp it. You can't see it, right? You, you can't own it. But it is also not just empty. It's also luminous consciousness, right? Unlike the sky, which is unknowing. Uh, it means knowing. It means beyond the duality of knower and known. There is pure knowing. And that's the nature of the mind, the empty quality which means it cannot be grasped, but it's all pervading like space, right? So, I mean, I could go on and on and on about this, but emptiness means empty of inherent self-existence. In other words, nothing, no person, no business, no nation, no atom exists in and of itself as an enduring entity, right? isolated, absolute, independent of everything else. Nothing exists like that, nothing. Emptiness points to the interconnectedness of all things, all processes and phenomena, right? Wow. So that wow. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Etzenra. Um, we've still got few minutes more. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Yael is asking, please explain what is meant by realizations. Do they only happen during meditation? Is there a certain order of sequence to realizations on the path? Well, you know, I mean, again, it's another word which is banded around and different people might mean different things by it. But at least in, in the Mahamudra and Zogchen systems, uh, realization rever refers to the recognition of the non-dual pure awareness, right? It, it's like, you know, the sky, and then we have clouds and rainbows and, you know, lightning flashes. We see the clouds, we identify with the clouds and the rainbows. We don't see the sky. Right, so we, we identify with our thinking, our dualistic thinking mind and all our emotions and feelings. We don't see where they rise from and where they sink back into, that's the problem. We don't see the sky, we just see the clouds. So first we have to learn to develop, therefore, the awareness that can observe our mental activity, right? without being swept away by it. Usually when we think we're, we're swept away by our, our thoughts and feelings, we're not even conscious that we're thinking. We're just thinking, right? So first we have to step back from that and observe the thoughts without being lost in the thoughts, right? The, the traditional example is that normally it's a river that we're swept away with. Now we're sitting on the banks watching the river. We're not in the river. We're not stopping the river. We're not damming the river. We're not trying to not have thoughts, but we are trying not to be totally identified and swept away by the thoughts, just to observe the thoughts, to be witness of the thoughts. Right? So that's the first thing. Then we learn to develop the awareness that um, is without an object. Then we drop the object of our awareness. Normally we are mindful of something. We're mindful of the breath. 
Uh, we're mindful of sensations, we're mindful of sound, we're mindful of the thoughts. So then we drop that object and we're just aware of being aware, right? Okay, you're just, just aware of being aware. And then also while we're looking at the thoughts, we can also see gaps between the thoughts perhaps. Um, past thought, future thought, then in that moment we see a gap. And that again is the nature of the mind, like the clouds parting and suddenly you see the sky and then the clouds come back together again. But now you know there is a sky, that it's not all clouds, that behind the clouds there is this huge, vast blue sky. And that, after that, that's what we are trying to uh, re reconnect with, is the sky and not the clouds. So that is realization. When we first see that glimpse of our pure primordial wisdom mind, that is a, a realization. And then after that is to stabilize it. That is a challenge, right? My Lama said, once you realize the nature of the mind, then you start to meditate. Right? Because what we're trying to do is to recognize uh, our, our pure awareness. So the point is that, you know, um, this, this, this awareness is, is, is empty but luminous. It, it's clear, luminous knowing, right? It's, it's, it's empty because you can't grasp it, you can't see it but it's, it's vast and open, spacious clarity of mind. So then we recognize that we are not our gross, chattering little mind that we normally identify with, right? But with the spacious clarity of our Buddha nature, which is beyond birth and death, and which interconnects us with all beings who likewise have Buddha nature, even though they don't know it yet. That is realization. Doesn't mean we're, we actually are 100% yet, you know, in that state, but at least we know it, it's there, right? We've seen it. And now we're going to try to work towards familiarizing ourselves and stabilizing the experience. Wow, that's a long way to have. No, it isn't because it's the closest thing in the world. I mean, even the texts say that it's like our eyelashes. It's so close we can't see them, right? It's who we really are, but we just don't see it. All we have to do is recognize it. It's not that we have to gain something we don't have. All we have to do is recognize what is already there, looking at us like this, but we, we can't see it. Yeah, okay. Mm. Thank you, mm. thank you so much. Actually, our hour is finished already, uh, so I don't know. I, I won't continue because I, I'll just say my deepest, all of our deepest gratitude for you joining us to, for this session. Uh, if you'd like to say to add something, uh, it's been such a privilege uh, having us, having you with us, and hopefully having you next time. You know, I mean, the point is just to keep going and, and never, as Ms. Olinda says, never give up. And, you know, even if we put one little hesitant foot in front of the other, at least we keep going. And, and we have trusted in our heart that this is the best thing we can do for both ourselves and for all other living beings on this planet. And to remember the goodness. I mean, you're in Israel and I, I know you hear bad news all the time. Remember the goodness, because everybody has goodness within them, and many, most people manifest the goodness outside of themselves too. And so don't always just listen to what the media is telling you or the bad things, but really, really think of all the goodness, that the kindness, the generosity, the sweetness, the compassion that people are manifesting all around you all the time. So please remember that. Remember the goodness. Thank you so much, Jitsunma. Really, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, my dear. Thank you for your questions. Thank everybody for their questions. Yeah, of um, I don't know if anything got through, but anyway, 
Thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. See you soon. Uh, so uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I'm reminding you, if you do wish to practice generosity, you can see the link of the donations in the chat. And uh, we really hope you benefited from this wonderful session with Jetsunma and we hope to see her soon with us the next time. Um, sorry we couldn't answer all the questions you have sent us. We really hope there will be a next time. So see you soon. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dharma Friends of Israel. Thank you very much for being this, for being here and having this opportunity. Bye-bye for now.